Today on the Perception in Action podcast, what exactly is self-organization? And why does there seem to be some persisting confusion about it? How does it differ from self-regulation? An attempt at some clarification. So it's time for a call to action. Hello, and thanks for joining me. This is Rob Gray from Arizona State University. I've been on a now over 25-year journey as a researcher, professor, and high-performance consultant to understand how we acquire and adapt our perceptual motor skills. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. If you're a coach or an instructor, my goal is to help you bridge the gap between research and application, and to connect your experiential knowledge with skill acquisition and motor learning theory. I want to help take you from using practice design recipes to becoming a master chef who can manipulate the key ingredients to come up with your own innovative training methods. If you're a student or fellow academic working in the skill acquisition field, I hope to keep you up to date on the latest studies and help you get to know the people working in this area. Finally, if you're developing training technologies, I hope to help you incorporate good motor learning principles in your design, pull out key performance metrics from the data, and design effective studies to evaluate your product. To learn more, help support the podcast, and or work directly with me, please check out perceptionaction.com. Now on to the show. In today's episode, I want to try to address an issue that seems to continue to persist in the coaching and movement science community, a misunderstanding about what exactly is meant by the term self-organization, in particular as it pertains to coordination and motor skill. For me, one of the main sources of confusion comes from the word self in the phrase. The word comes preloaded with concepts of explicit, top-down, asymmetric control from a central executive. I am quote-unquote self-motivated. I'm a self-learner. I'm going to do it myself. I'm a self-made millionaire. In other words, I, my brain, is taking charge of the situation by coming up with an explicit plan of what to do. It implies a linear hierarchical form of control, where you, again your brain, is telling your body what to do. I'm taking control of the components of the system, setting the degrees of freedom of movement to achieve my goal. For this reason, when people hear the phrase, the athlete self-organizes, it brings to mind for some the incorrect idea that the athlete is figuring it out on their own. That is, they are developing motor programs, schema, representations, and mental models that they will use to control their movement on their own through experience interacting with their environment rather than having these things just given to them by a coach. They are on a journey of self-discovery. They are understanding through playing. They know the goal they have been given and by leaving them to play the game, they will figure out on their own how to tell their different body parts what they should be doing. They will solve the degrees of freedom problem in movement by learning to program the different parts of their body. For example, my elbow needs to be at this angle, etc. When we begin with this concept of self preloaded with the traditional asymmetric view of motor control and learning, it leads to two very problematic and again incorrect assumptions about the use of coaching methods, like the CLA, designed to promote self-organization. First is the annoyingly persistent idea that self-organization means completely hands-off coaching, where the coach is not allowed to give any explicit instructions or step in and interfere with the practice activity once it has been started. If the athlete is going to be a self-learner or self-made, we don't want to interfere with this process. If self-organization is developing representations and mental models through experience, then the experience is all the athlete needs, right? The second problem is that when we use this concept of self, it implies that the organization will always be relative to our externally defined outcome criteria, the goal we're trying to achieve. Self-motive people are acting so as to lose weight. Self-learners read to increase the number of words in their vocabulary, etc. They know the outcome they're trying to achieve. The changes in behavior that will occur will all be moving them towards achieving our overall externally defined goal. For example, if we tell a baseball player we want you to hit the ball to all fields and we let them self-organize, the changes in their swing will be getting them closer to this performance criteria we have defined. These issues are problematic because when we start with this conceptualization of self-organization and try to implement a coaching method like the CLA in practice, it often fails and leads to a coach quickly giving up on using this approach. Common reactions I hear include, 
The athlete does not have the basic understanding of the skill needed to self-organize. They never can figure out how to control the movement on their own. The solution they come up with on their own is not effective at all. This self-organization stuff is nonsense. Why is this view of self-organization incorrect? I will get to the asymmetric linear view of learning in a second, but first I want to address something that is missing from my description so far. That is constraints. When we use the term self-organization, what we really mean is self-organization under constraints. The addition of these words is important because it addresses the two problems I just mentioned. Self-organization does not occur in a vacuum. When an athlete self-organizes, they do so in a manner that optimizes behavior relative to the constraints opposed on them, not relative to some external performance criteria. They are not optimizing performance globally, that is using the absolute best movement solution in any area of the solution space. They are organizing towards what is called constrained optimality. That is a local solution that satisfies the current constraints. When we gripe that the athlete is self-organizing into an ineffective solution, the CLA doesn't work, we are typically assessing the solution relative to our externally defined performance outcome goal, when we need to be assessing it relative to the constraints we have created in the practice activity. This is why the CLA is not just simply something like, let's reduce the number of players and let them play. It requires much more skill from the coach than that. In designing the practice, we need to make sure the constraints are aligned with our overall performance criteria. That is, they create boundaries in the solution space that take away or limit movement solutions that will not be effective in achieving the overall performance goal. If I'm trying to train a baseball batter by having them hit off a pitching machine that's always set on the same setting, they're going to self-organize around the constraint of constant pitch speed. They're not going to self-organize into a solution that is optimal for the overall performance criteria of the coach, becoming an effective hitter that can face pitchers with varying speeds. Local constrained optimality, not global optimization of a performance criteria. The fact that the athlete has a cognitive understanding of the fact that they need to be able to adjust their swing for different pitch speeds is irrelevant because this is not what is guiding the self-organization process. This is also why using the CLA will typically involve iterations of practice activities. As a coach, I'll typically set a practice activity, but it might lead to an ineffective local movement solution, so I need to change it by adding different constraints. Bringing in constraints also addresses the incorrect idea that using methods like the CLA is totally hands-off coaching and just letting them figure it out on their own. When I hear people complain, they often say something like, would you just let a student stand at the board and try to learn math without any instruction? Or would you let a pilot just jump in a plane and figure out how the controls work on their own? No, of course you wouldn't. Neither of these are examples of what we're actually trying to achieve in methods like the CLA. We're not just giving the learner a goal and letting them try to figure out how to achieve it. We are imposing constraints to guide them to a solution. Self-organized solutions do not just appear magically out of thin air. As Glazier and Robbins state in their excellent 2013 chapter on the topic, quote, Although self-organization occupies a central role in the evolution of physiological and biomechanical processes, it alone is insufficient. To guide and shape emergent pattern formation among degrees of freedom of a system, self-organization processes need to be juxtaposed with competing and cooperating internal and external constraints that pressure the system into changes of organizational state. End quote. Just having a student stand at a blackboard doing math or throwing a pilot into a plane is not coaching to promote self-organization. It's not coaching at all. Coaching to promote self-organization involves thoughtful, and principled manipulation and adjustment of constraints that pushes a system into changing its state, not just throwing an athlete into a situation and letting them learn it themselves. The other issue, of course, is that the loaded connotation of the word self leads to interpretation based on completely the wrong theory of motor control and learning, one involving asymmetric executive control over one's environment. The boss, the central executive in my brain, controls my body via motor programs, schemas, or representations. Organization of the different parts of my body comes from top-down commands given by the head office, telling workers in the lowly motor control department what to do. This theory of skillful behavior is not consistent with the ideas of self-organization at all. To again quote from the Glazier and Robbins chapter, 
Self-organization is a process in which a pattern at the global level of a system emerges solely from the numerous interactions among the lower level components of the system. Moreover, the rules specifying the interaction among the system's components are executed using only local information without reference to the global pattern. In other words, self-organization is a process whereby structure or pattern emerges in an open system without specification from an intelligent executive or an external regulating agent. And quote, instead of relying on anthropomorphic concepts such as programs, plans, and schemas to resolve the degrees of freedom problem, Kugler et al. argued that order and regularity in the human movement system emerge from the free interplay of forces and mutual influences among components tending toward equilibrium or steady states. That is, they self-organize. End quote. To understand this more, let's compare and contrast two things you might see at your local football field, a marching band and a flock of birds. Both of these systems involve a set of components that move in a highly organized and coordinated way. The band members march out highly entertaining patterns of movement, while the birds dive and swoop together in different directions. But let's think for a second about how the organization arises in each of these cases. The marching band uses our traditional asymmetric model of control. The central executive, the choreographer, comes up with the action plan and gives specific instructions to each of the band members. When you get to the 50-yard line, turn left, etc. Organization comes from having a good plan and each member executing it without any errors. The birds, on the other hand, have no central controller. There is no leader bird in a flock that is telling all the other birds which direction to turn and when. There is no avian choreographer. How is it possible for there to be order and organization if it's not imposed by leadership from above? The incredible feats of high speed and precise coordination we see in a flock of birds are so astounding that they've been attributed to some pretty far-fetched mechanisms over the years. Early explanations for flocking included thought transference and electromagnetic communication. A more plausible theory of flocking behavior in birds was proposed by Wayne Potts in 1984. Potts filmed flocking maneuvers made by a species of bird called the Dunlin. The first thing he observed was that the time between one bird starting its turn and the others following seemed to be too short to be physically possible. When he startled a bird with a light flash in the lab, their reaction time was about 40 milliseconds. Yet their time to start a turn in the flock was only about 15 milliseconds. When flocking, they were essentially turning faster than they could react. What's going on here? Potts proposed that the birds were essentially forming an avian chorus line. He observed that maneuvers began with a small number of birds, usually one, turning into the flock. This caused the birds closest to it to react and turn away. As this continues, birds further from the original agitator bird see all this occurring and begin to anticipate that they're going to need to turn in much in the same way the members of a chorus line look down the line to anticipate when they're going to have to lift their leg. This anticipation causes a propagation through the flock leading to higher, faster than reaction time speeds we see in the sky. The model of control used by a flock of birds is one of self-organization. That is, the order and structure in the system arises from the interactions between the lower level components of the system, not from some rules or plan given by a higher level central controller. When we self-organize, our actions are directly controlled by what we perceive, without any need for processing and analysis of the information. When we act, it changes the information coming in from a perceptual system, and through this, decisions emerge. Think again about a flock of birds. A bird in a flock does not turn because it's given an instruction to do so, nor does it really make an explicit decision, I need to turn now. Flying in a flock requires the bird to continuously adjust its movements based on perceptual information about how close its neighbors are. When the agitator bird in Pot's study turned back into the flock, this information would tell its nearest neighbor bird, it's getting too close, so they would turn away. The decision was part and parcel with what they were already doing in controlling their flight. Perceiving, acting, and deciding are all working together. This is a symmetrical, coupled relationship between the performer and their environment. So critically, even though the word self is in the term, self-organization is not the same as being a self-starter, self-made, or figuring it out yourself. All of those things imply asymmetric executive control of the system, a choreographer, that is not at all what we mean by the term self-organization. Self-organization means that order and regularity come from local interactions between the components of the system, not that the athletes figures out how to do it on their own. 
I'm not suggesting we actually make this change because the term is used in several fields of science and it's important we keep the connection, but a better descriptor of what we mean by the term would be emergent organization. A final issue that I see sometimes is comes when we conflate self-organization with self-regulation in sports. Self-organization, as we're using it here, pertains to the coordination of degrees of freedom in movement. Self-regulation refers to the ability of an athlete to plan, monitor, and evaluate their practice activities when attempting to achieve a performance goal. This is discussed nicely in a recent paper by Duvenvorden and colleagues. Quote, self-regulated learners autonomously engage in a forethought phase, a performance phase, and a self-reflection phase in which thoughts, feelings, and actions support the attainment of personal goals. During the forethought phase, these athletes analyze the task and regulate self-motivational beliefs. Task analysis includes goal setting and strategic planning of subsequent practice in order to achieve intended goals. In the subsequent performance phase, they apply the plan strategy and perform the motor task. In effective self-regulation guided by self-control and self-observation. The final phase of the self-regulated learning cycle is the self-reflection phase. This phase follows performance and consists of self-judgment and self-reaction. Effective self-regulated learners use self-judgment to evaluate planning and performance and make attributions with respect to success and failure, affecting subsequent forethought processes. End quote. These things are clearly not the same as the processes we're referring to when we talk about self-organization of movement and coordination. They refer to setting goals for practice, making sure the practice plan is stuck to, and evaluation of the performance outcomes, not the control of movement. However, and I don't want to confuse the issues by getting into this too much, these aspects of self-regulation can also emerge from self-organization processes. For example, as I discussed in episode 335 when looking at skilled intentionality, goals can emerge from self-organization. But the bottom line is planning and assessing a practice activity, self-regulation, does not imply planning a movement, which is not self-organization. So to sum up today's episode, to properly understand and apply the concept of self-organization and skill acquisition, we need to set aside our preconception of the word self. Self-organization does not mean a learner figuring things out on their own. That is developing their own asymmetric executive control system. Nor does it involve organization towards some predefined performance outcome criterion. Even when the performer is cognitively aware of that criteria, it involves constrained optimality optimization relative to the actual constraints imposed in the practice activity used. The bottom line is that self-organization is going to occur whether you like it or not. It is a ubiquitous property of nature. Like I discussed in my last episode on biotensegrity, the human body seems to be designed to coordinate itself via local interactions between the components of the system without some high-level controller telling it what to do. Coaching methods designed to promote this, like the CLA, are basically doing two things. They remove things that interfere with this process, like prescriptive solutions that have to be implemented by a central controller, decoupling of information and action, or attempts to develop an athlete's mental model of the system. And they shape the process by setting and altering the constraints around which the system self-organize. So you can choose to attempt to override this process or harness it. But, as is hopefully more clear now, you can't self-organize yourself. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at Shakeaways. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including written transcripts, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perceptionaction. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now, and keep them coupled. Listen, listen.